we might as well start, I suppose, with a definition of personality. It's hard to define something that's that general because when you're speaking about human beings, it's not that simple to figure out what constitutes personality and what constitutes something else. But, so I'm going to hit at it from a couple of different perspectives. And while I'm doing so, <clears throat> I would like you also to consider the nature of what you're going to learn. A human personality is essentially unfathomable. Human beings are unbelievably complicated and, and we're nested in systems that are also unbelievably complicated. There are more patterns of connections between neurons in your brain than there are subatomic particles in the universe by a substantial margin. You can look up Gerald Edelman if you want to find out about that. And so, it's not unreasonable to point out that you're the most complicated thing we know of by many orders of magnitude. And the probability that you can understand yourself in anything approaching totality is extraordinarily low. So this makes the study of personality something very daring and hopeless and complicated. Well, the structural elements of personality might be regarded as the implicit structures that govern your perception and that tilt you towards certain kinds of behaviors. I, I can give you some examples. We, we can talk about the Big Five model just briefly. The Big Five personality model is a statistical model which we'll cover in detail, trait by trait. The way that the Big Five was generated was that it's been generated over about 50 years, that personality psychologists gathered together adjectives within the English language first that were used to describe human beings, as many adjectives as they could collect, and then subjected them to a process called factor analysis. And what factor analysis does is enable you statistically to determine, in some sense, how similar adjectives are to one another. So, for example, if you gave a thousand people a list of adjectives to describe themselves with, and one of the adjectives was happy, and another of the ad adjectives was social, you'd find that those who rated themselves high on happy would also rate themselves high on social, and those who rated themselves low on happy would also rate themselves low on social. And by looking at those patterns of covariation, you can determine what the essential dimensions are of human personality. One of the dimensions is, roughly, happiness. That's extroversion. Another dimension is neuroticism. It's a negative emotion dimension, so if you ask someone if they're anxious and they score high, say, on a scale of 1 to 7, they're also likely to score high on another item that says that they're sad. And it turns out that negative emotions clump together, and so that people who experience more of one negative emotion have a propensity to experience more of all of them. There's another dimension called agreeableness. And agreeable people are self-sacrificing, compassionate, and polite. If you're dealing with an agreeable person, they don't like conflict. They care for other people. Um, if you're dealing with an agreeable person, they're likely to put your concerns ahead of theirs. They're non-competitive and cooperative. Uh, it's a dimension where women are Women score more highly than men on agreeableness across cultures, including those cultures where the largest steps have been taken towards producing an egalitarian social circumstance like Scandinavia. Actually, the gender differences in personality there are larger than they are anywhere else. Um, another trait is conscientiousness. Conscientiousness is an excellent trait if you want to do well in, in school and in work, especially if you're a manager and administrator. I can't say we understand a lot about conscientiousness, although it, it reliably emerges from factor analytic studies of adjective groups across different countries. Conscientious people are diligent, industrious, and orderly. 
Their orderliness tilts them towards political conservatism, by the way, because it turns out that your inbuilt temperament, your inbuilt personality, which constitutes a set of filters through which you view the world, also alters the manner in which you process information and influences the way that you vote. And so you might say, and I, I do believe that this is true, our, we've been doing a lot of research on this as of late, The more accurate a measure you take of someone's political beliefs, the more you find that personality is what's predicting them. And I, I think that's a reasonable thing to think about because, you know, you have, to, you have to figure out ways of simplifying the world, right? Because you just can't do everything. And so people are specialized. They have specialized niches that they occupy. You can think about them as social niches. A niche is a place where your particular skills would serve to maintain you. And so if you're extroverted, you're going to look for a social niche because you like to be around people. And if you're introverted, you're going to spend much more time on your own. And so if you're an introverted person, for example, you're going to want a job where you're not selling and where you're not surrounded by groups of people who are making social demands on you all the time because it'll wear you out. Whereas if you're extroverted, that's just exactly what you want. And so the extrovert sees the world as a place of social opportunity. And the introvert sees the world as a place to retreat from and spend time alone. And it turns out that both of those modes of being are valid. The, the issue, at least to some degree, is whether or not you're fortunate enough to match your temperament with the demands of the environment. And I suppose also whether you're fortunate enough, fortunate enough so that you're born in an era where there actually is a niche for your particular temperament. Because it isn't necessarily the case that that will be the case. Imagine that all of these temperamental dimensions vary because of evolutionary pressure, right? So there's a distribution of extroversion, a normal distribution. Most people are somewhere in the middle, and then as you go out towards the extremes, there are fewer and fewer people. And what that means is that on average, across large spans of time, there have been environments that match every single position on that distribution with most, most of the environments matching the center because otherwise we wouldn't have evolved that way and so sometimes being really extroverted is going to work well for you in a minority of environments, a minority of niches and sometimes it's just going to be a catastrophe conscientious people, anyways, conscientious people are industrious and orderly we know a little bit about orderliness it seems to be associated, strangely enough, with disgust sensitivity, which I suppose isn't that su surprising. You know, if you take an orderly person and you put them in a messy kitchen, they respond with disgust and want nothing more than to straighten it all out and organize it and clean it. And there's tremendous variability in orderliness. Um, and as I said, orderliness predicts political conservatism. It's not the only thing, but it's certainly one of the things. Anyways, the last trait is openness. Openness is a creativity trait. It's also associated with intelligence in that intelligent people, and I'm speaking technically of IQ, tend to be higher and tend to be more creative, which is hardly surprising. Creative people are more likely to be liberal politically, by the way. Um, they like novelty, they like aesthetics, they like fiction, they like movies, they like art, they like poetry. There's something about them that grants them an aesthetic sensitivity. And, and that's, a, that's an inbuilt trait. And um, it's not the case, by the way, that everyone's creative. In fact, far from it. Uh, we've used the Creative Achievement Questionnaire to, to measure people's creativity. I'll talk to you about that later in the class. And the Creative Achievement Questionnaire takes 13 dimensions of creativity. So, you know, writing, dancing, acting, scientific investigation, entrepreneurial activity, architectural activity, uh, cooking, um, there's, a, there's a handful of others, singing, etc. You know, the sorts of things that you would assume that people could be creative about. And then it asks people to rate themselves on a scale from 1 to 10 on their level of achievement with regards to all those creative domains, with zero being, I have no training or proficiency in this area, and 70% of people score zero across the entire Creative Achievement Questionnaire. A tiny proportion of people are outliers way out and they're creative in many dimensions simultaneously and exceptionally creative and it turns out as you'll find out that that pattern which is called a Pareto distribution where most people stack up at zero and a few people are way out on the creative end 
characterizes all sorts of distributions, like the distribution of money, for example, which is why 1% of the people have the overwhelming majority of the money. It's a different 1% across time, it, it, like it churns, and you're much more likely to be in the 1% if you're older, logically enough, because one of the things you do as you age is you trade youth for money, if you're fortunate. I don't think the trade is really worth it, but that's the best you've got. <laughs>